this session from the Teaching Center during New Year, New Horizons, Empowering Educators is titled Forced Moves, Mindfulness, and Classroom C Conflict. Harlan Pease is going to be our presenter. And Harlan, thank you so much for preparing this presentation for us today. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I know this is day five of of in-services, or I, I don't know if we use that word anymore, but uh, we do appreciate, I certainly appreciate the number of people who showed up. I expected it would be very few, so I'm very pleased to see you all here. Thank you. Um, and so for those of you who are early, were here earlier, mindfulness, uh, Janessa mentioned yoga. Yeah, we're going to talk about some mindfulness concepts and so forth. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll get into this. And I will find my PowerPoint, which is here. And I selected a picture of a dog. It's completely irrelevant, but I like the picture. I was like, this is cool. Uh, so you'll note that I just put conflict here because what we're going to talk about is conflict in general, although it's applicable to classrooms. And I'm going to use a couple examples involving the classroom that we will think about and so forth. But let's just jump into this. Um, here's something to ponder. So one thing we're going to talk about today is perceptions and how our perceptions are often uh, incorrect. And uh, I love this idea of like, I'm average except for the fact that I'm above average at being average. Uh, there was a study of uh, they surveyed 50 drivers and asked them, you know, how good they thought they were driving. And they almost all rated themselves as experts. And this was despite the fact that they'd all recently been in an accident. And two thirds of them were at fault. Uh, so just a little primer for an idea we're going to encounter, which is that what we uh, perceive isn't always is a, isn't always 100 percent accurate. But let's jump in here. So. We're not going to talk about chess directly, but in chess, there's a concept called a forced move. And if you see the screen here, you'll see the yellow highlight on the rook is threatening the king, which has the red highlight, and the king is forced to move. If it doesn't move, game over. So there's this idea in chess of a move that is forced. It's the only option. The king can't do anything else. And then there's an, an idea of a forcing move. Whoops, sorry. And in a forcing move, you don't have to respond, but if you don't, bad things will happen. So this is an idea, it's a metaphor we're going to build on in this particular example, this white piece with the two arrows emanating from it. The knight is threatening the queen, which is a high value piece, and it's also threatening a pawn, which would create a fork, yada, yada, yada. If you want to win the game, you have to respond. And this is a metaphor we're going to build on in this idea of forced moves and forcing moves. So let's take it outside of this and think about something emotional. And if any of you are poker fans or were poker fans back in the heyday, you remember these players. And if you don't, the player on your right is Phil Hellmuth. And as you can see by his facial expression and body language, he's experiencing a little bit of tension. And the player immediately next to him is Tony G, who is has a reputation for getting under people's skin. And um, Tony G is about to very much get under Phil Helmuth's skin. If you, in, 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 metaphorically speaking, um, if you know the game of, of, of poker, you'll see that Phil Helmuth has a better hand here, but he's about to make a mistake. And he thinks he's in a forcing move situation and he's about to go on tilt. So this idea of tilt you can go ahead and read this definition. So when Tony G gets Phil Helmuth on tilt, Phil's going to make a bad decision. 
and in poker, a bad decision that involved obviously thousands, sometimes even millions of dollars. Um, and it's a term that connects to chess. One thing about those forcing moves is they might not be decisive, but they kind of put you on your heels and you're backing up and it, the emotions get involved. That's the idea behind this. Tilt is when the emotions get involved and you start making decisions through a different perception. You're looking at it in a different way, um, which is why I'm average, except in that I consider myself above average because our ego is very much tied to our emotions and our sense of self and so forth. So that's kind of the basic idea we're going to look at here. Um, it comes from pinball. And if you've ever played pinball on an actual physical machine, if you rock the machine, you nudge it, it, it flashes a warning. And if you do it enough or you do it too hard, the machine goes on tilt and it basically, you lose, it freezes up. So with Phil Hellmuth, it's not just the one thing that Tony G does, it's that Tony G has done it to him a lot. And so have other players. And Phil's ego gets involved and he shows up at the table and he's got the cumulative effect of all kinds of small nudges that are forced moves. Because Phil Helmuth has declared himself the greatest player ever, when people challenge him, he sees it as a forced move. He has to respond. He has to show them who's boss. So we've tied these ideas together in that these moves might be a it might be a forcing move or it might be a perceived forcing move so for example if you were walking on the street and someone approaches you with a weapon and says give me your money you are in a forced move situation and your options are limited but often we're not in that kind of life or death situation even though our brain particularly our lizard brain responds as if it is a forced situation we have to respond in some way and that's kind of what we're going to look at today. So this idea of perceived forcing moves, how we respond to them. Um, and we're going to think about mindfulness. And what's going on? Here we go. So I said what I was going to say when I meant to have this blank slide here. So let's look at some forced responses. And here we have the six basic emotions going uh from the upper left across, we have happiness, surprise, uh, surprise, sadness, disgust, and anger. Okay. Or at least that's my interpretation of them. We <laughs> Sometimes when I show this to students, they don't always agree, particularly on uh, some of them. Uh, surprise, fear, um, et cetera. So I misspoke one about one. But the emotions, an easy way to remember it, sad, angry, disgust, fear interest, surprise, and happiness are happy. And it spells out sad fish. But the six basic emotions combine interest and surprise, which go together. Okay, so those, are, those are two branches of that. So these are basic emotions that we all feel. And what is an emotion? So an emotion is a physiological response to some sort of stimulus. And when we go through the perception process, something stimulates us, we pay attention to it, we organize it in a certain way, we interpret it, evaluate it, and our body responds, depending on the stimulus, with some sort of chemical cocktail for these basic, um, basic emotions. Emotions are not feelings, though. So I still struggle with interchanging feelings versus emotions, but it's important that we recognize that an emotion is a physiological response and a feeling is a psychological response. It's an interpretation of that. And a way to think about that is um, most people experience 
a physiological response before they do public speaking of any kind. If any of us had to walk up in front of convocation, um, although Audrey looked cool as a cucumber when she did it this earlier this spring, um, most of us are going to experience something, some kind of physiological response. And our brain interprets that as maybe it's excitement or maybe it's stress. Maybe it's anxiety, but the physiological response is the same. Your body is kind of preparing for this situation. So it's important that we recognize feelings, as they say, feelings aren't facts. And honestly, emotions, the interpretation of emotions aren't facts, although emotions are clearly a factual physiological response. So This is why one person can experience something in a totally different way from somebody else, have a completely different understanding of what happened. Um, remember that idea of perception, perceived forced moves, and how two people can um, you know, maybe have a disagreement and one person can think it was really productive and the other person feel like it was, it was terrible um, and et, et cetera. So this kind of an important idea, um, these, this, if you see someone attractive, I mean, that's stimulating interest, um, maybe surprise, maybe happiness. So you can see how a bunch of things come together and then you're experiencing a bunch of, of emotions, excuse me, feelings related to those emotional responses. Okay. So the force is indeed within us. Um, and it's just a, a very, very basic emotions wheel excuse me, feelings wheel based on the emotions in the middle. See, I keep messing that up. And you could add circle after circle after circle of nuanced responses to fear um, as an example. Uh, and they are not mutually exclusive. Um, I would argue that fear maybe brings an element of excitement to it. And why do we watch horror movies? What are we trying to get out of our system? There's something titillating about it. Um, I would certainly argue that anger and many other people would too, it has an element of satisfaction to it, um, to be righteously angry at other people feels good. And certainly the internet and social media and YouTube have capitalized on this ability to, you know, catch us with a headline and make us feel righteously angry at someone, um, Aaron Rodgers was mentioned earlier, and I'm not a football fan, but even I'm aware of Aaron Rodgers apparently saying some things that, you know, got Twitter all ablaze or X or whatever it is called these days, because there's something about it. So there's a, it, these are not mutually exclusive things. And you can begin to see how this cocktail of chemicals as emotional responses can combine. And then our brains take over and, re, and interpret it psychologically and because we are prone to perceiving things in our through our own lens, mistakes happen. That's the that's the basic idea behind it. So let's look at feelings. This is sort of from an evolutionary uh, psychology perspective. It's not sort of it is, but feelings are judgments. And at a most basic level, why do we have feelings? Uh, they help us procreate and survive. And that's really why they exist. Why do you have a feeling towards a potential mate? Uh, because beyond our conscious or before our pre-conscious mind, I guess, there's, there's the desire to procreate. Why are we drawn to sweet fruit? Because it's healthy for us. Um, and negative feelings were designed to do exactly the same thing. Um, if we experience disgust at, a, at rotten flesh, hopefully we won't consume this which increases our chance of survival, which increases our chance of getting our genes into the next generation and so forth. So at a very basic level, feelings are judgments about our environment, okay? And they signal approach or avoid. So, However, we developed and we developed civilizations and circumstances and all kinds of stuff happening. And we start to experience something like stress. 
And stress is very much a feeling. It's not an emotion, although it feels like it's pretty, pretty real. But to go back to the public speaking, stress, one person's stress is another person's excitement based on the exact same physiological response. Jealousy. Where does jealousy fit in there? I mean, it could feel like anger, but there's something else going on there. Maybe it's disgust. Maybe it's fear. If it's sexual jealousy, probably fear is involved. And you can see how this could be related to procreation and so forth. But these are getting into some pretty complicated things that feel very real. And I'm guessing all of us have experienced jealousy that felt tangible and palpable. Um, and certainly stress. What is melancholy? It's not quite sadness. It's so we get these very sophisticated things that, you know, they're triggered by things that are biological and evolutionary, but ultimately are circumstances of a modern world that's that's complex, and we're not really trained as to how to deal with them. So we go from this idea of feelings being approach and avoid to judgments. And this is problematic for a, a lot of interaction, interpersonal relationships. Um, so we're in the when we're in the classroom and we experience that some sort of feeling, some sort of feeling of frustration, um, maybe we're feeling disrespected, we're feeling not heard, uh, all kinds of things. We're get, getting involved in a judgment about something in our environment, and that can get tricky in a hurry. Uh, that's the basic idea we're working with. I'm sure that's self-evident at this point. So here's a picture, and I want you to tell me, well, you can either speak it out or put it in a chat or whatever makes you happy, what this person is experiencing. Anyone have an emotion there? I hear There's the lots in the chat. Excitement, fear, excitement, and fear, thrill, joy, exhilaration are all hopping in there. All right. Excitement and fear. That's, so you've combined a couple there. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, I would obviously grab this picture because it isn't like, I don't know if a skydiving school or or business would use this picture because it's, I'm not sure it's in, there's not a degree of ambivalence about what that person's feeling. Happiness, extreme excitement. Okay. So I would probably suggest that, yeah, I will go ahead and suggest that our interpretation of it probably has something to do with our, how we filter the idea of skydiving in general. Um, but this person is definitely having a physiological response. I think you'd have to be almost dead to not experience something at the thought of jumping out of an airplane. And it's a great example of how one person's fear is another person's excitement is another person's extreme excitement is it is joy. And uh, and, and we do interpret these things. Um, excitement, happiness, fear, fear. I'd be scared to death. So I'm, <laughs> I'm leaning towards fear. Although I could see there being something about it that's sort of, you probably feel pretty good when it was over. So I think I'd be anticipating excitement, but uh, yeah. Um, our faces are telling a story. This person is responding to something in their environment. And uh, to think about it from kind of a mindfulness perspective and controlling your emotions, it's one of those situations that's so extreme. I think it would be, again, be really hard to just sort of be like, yeah, I'm cool with this. I'm just going to roll with it and see what happens. <laughs> you know, I'm chill. Uh, maybe if you've done it a hundred times. So if you ask the question, what kind of perception, thoughts, and feelings guide us through life each day? It isn't the kinds of thoughts and feelings and perceptions that give us an accurate picture of reality. Remember, these feelings are judgments. And from an evolutionary psychology perspective, they're designed to help us procreate. So the answer is the kind of thoughts and feelings and perceptions to help our ancestors get genes into the next generation. Um, 
So to go back to the public speaking as an example, public speaking is often listened, listed as like, the people are more scared of public speaking than dying. And as Jerry Seinfeld said, so you're better off being in the casket than giving the eulogy. Um, but if we look at it from an evolutionary psychology perspective, if you lived in a small village, let's say there are a hundred people, your pool of pot potential mates is very limited to that small community. So the idea of making a fool of yourself would matter a lot. Now that's tempered by the idea that these people would know you and have known you since you were an infant. But when we think about it from that perspective, you can see how public speaking would be terrifying because every potential mate is, is hearing you. And if you do make a fool of yourself, that's bad. Even worse, if you were ostracized from the village for saying something that was offensive to the elders, you'd be on your own. It's not like you can just you know, get in your car and dr drive to the next town over and start fresh. Um, so if you think about why we might experience anxiety from, a pub from public speaking and you connect it to this idea of potential mates, well, there's a whole lot of pressure to just kind of conform and be normal. And let's face it, public speaking generally isn't, isn't normal. <laughs> um, I mean, it is, but you get the idea. For our students, it certainly isn't a normal part of their existence. So we want to remember when we experience feelings that they are emotions and the feeling is our interpretation of it. And our interpretation is being guided by things that might not be what's really happening. And so if we experience a conflict with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a peer, um, even though we are probably not thinking anything even remotely related to procreating, we are still in a situation where we're being triggered by something that has to do with defending our honor. You know, they say in prison, if you want to survive, you've got to fight. Doesn't matter if you lose, people need to know there's a cost associated with messing with you. And we aren't that evolved from that mentality in life, in general life, when we, anywhere. Someone challenges us, we, you know, we bubble up with this feeling of anger or of this emotion of anger that we feel disrespected, we feel whatever. So that's kind of a fundamental idea that our feelings, remember, are judgments designed to, uh, to judge our environment, but they're not necessarily based on reality and real situations. Oops, I lost my, here we go. For example, donuts. Um, donuts have no practical value. Some of you might argue with me about this, but from a, from a, from a perspective of uh, what we need to nourish our bodies, um, donuts don't really serve any, but from an evolutionary psychology perspective, they're sweet, there's fat, there's calories, mmm, donuts. Um, so we have a mismatch, an environmental mismatch. Uh, things that worked in a primitive society don't necessarily help us in a modern society. And I'm sure you can see where this is going. We experience conflict and we resort to some sort of primordial response to stimulus and we feel like it's fact and we respond before <laughs> um, so current research uh, shows us that we think we're in charge but we're not it's, it's feelings that decide which module will be in charge for the time being and it's modules that then decide what you'll actually do during that time and this relates to the, I should have introduced this with the current theory is that the brain has modules and Different modules take control in different situations, and this is happening outside of our consciousness. Um, there isn't some clear self that's the CEO that's in charge. It's, it's actually these modules. So to give an example, um, when people drink alcohol, their inhibitions are usually lowered, and it's because that alcohol is affecting that module, which is why people who uh, you know, drink and do other things, and then they 
maybe behave irrationally in this way. It's not like it's a universally blanketing the brain type of thing unless you drink a lot. Um, so there's an expression speaking of alcohol that I've heard from people who are in recovery. And they say it's only a movie. And the way I've often heard it is um, to not take it too seriously, that it's only a movie and it's a, something they use kind of almost as a mantra to keep themselves from getting emotionally invested because they know those things lead to relapses. But I would encourage you to think about it uh, um, with that idea, but maybe like one thing about when we watch a movie is we only get to see what the camera decides we're going to see, what the camera frames. And it's important to remember when we go through life, we're doing the same thing. We are very much looking at a frame and we are selecting that through selective exposure, selective attention. And we are watching a movie that I'd have, well, I know what's behind me right now, but I don't know what's behind what's behind me. Um, but that's part of reality. As an example, when you go with further with this, the idea is it's, it's only a movie and it's directing us. And this is the part that can be problematic to wrap our brains around is that the idea that we think we're in charge when in, re in reality, pun intended, um, and the movie's directing us. We're responding emotionally to things. We're and then we have feelings and these feelings make us act. And this has been shown over and over again and so forth. So there's an expression in Buddhism, not just Buddhism, but that thoughts think themselves. And again, we might not like this idea. We'd like to think we're in charge. But I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room can relate to the idea of being thinking thoughts that you wish you couldn't think. You just wish you could shut them out, shut them off. I feel like I live that way sometimes. Um, thoughts think themselves and they direct the movie because they're going to influence as Kirsten said yesterday in her presentation about your actions influence your thoughts, which influences your emotional state, which influences, you know, you, you're caught up in it. I hope I paraphrase that correctly, Kirsten. Uh, so we get into what's called a perceptual illusion. And a study was done where a makeup artist put a scar on people's face, on people's faces, and then they had them go have a conversation. And when the people came back from the conversation, they asked them their experience of the conversation. And universally, they indicated that the scar influenced the conversation and people were afraid to make eye contact. And they, but what the people didn't know is just before they went out to have the conversation, the makeup artist said, I need to touch that up and actually remove the scar. So the people went out thinking the scar was there when it was not there. And then just thinking the scar was there caused them to perceive it through this illusory sense. Um, again, emphasizing this idea that what we think is reality isn't reality. And you don't need a scar on your face to go through this. If you're having a bad day, you're going to interpret a conversation in a different way. And I, I can't imagine there's any of us who haven't, haven't experienced that. Um, one day I drop the coffee cup and laugh. The next day, my life is just going to hell in a handbasket. Um, and it has very little to do with the coffee cup dropping. Um, so we get into this perceptual illusion and we are designed to not examine our feelings they are discouraged. We dis if we're feeling anger, anger is resistant to the idea that maybe we should think about like, hey, should we really be angry? No, that whatever it is wants to short circuit that. So we get into perceptual illusions and let's get to the point. What can we do? Any questions so far? I'm talking for a half an hour. Marlon, there are none in the chat right now. Okay. I'm going to bully on here then. And um, this is where the mindfulness parts come in, comes in. And well, I'm not an expert and this isn't about meditation, but there are three kinds of meditation. 
and there's the Zen, and then there's a vinyasa, and I don't even remember the other one, but mindfulness meditation is connected to this idea of um, people kind of, I mentioned there are three because I think people have sort of this idea of meditation that is some different state, but all mindfulness, mindfulness meditation is, is paying attention to what our thoughts are doing and trying to stop ourselves from chasing them. And it focuses on the breath as an anchor. So you have something to come back to. Um, and the idea is to separate the act of observation from the act of evaluation. Uh, it's something I've been practicing for a, a, over, a little over a year now, and it's extraordinarily frustrating uh, to say the least, um, but it, it works, it, it does work. And it's obviously difficult, it happens so quickly and our brains respond. And even more tricky, studies have shown that we, we backstory, we do something, and then we create a story to explain and rationalize our actions. And some interesting studies have been done um, with people who've had brain surgeries, maybe separating the hemisphere. So those hemispheres aren't communicating. Um, other situations where uh, people have, um, well, as an example, um, people tend to choose what's on the right. So if you line up four identical things and you ask people to choose, they'll tend to statistically go toward the right and then they'll explain it as they think that item is better uh, as an example. So we're kind of caught in that. And the only thing we can do is try to be mindful and separate the act of observation from the act of evaluation. We can develop a different relationship with our feelings. We can recognize that feelings are just psychological interpretations of something we're feeling physiologically. So one practice in meditation is when you're feeling something, is just try to drill down into like what's going on in my body. And if we connect to what's happening in the body and focus on that. So if I'm experiencing stress, I tend to feel it right in my diaphragm and in my jaw. So instead of responding to the stress, if I just kind of focus in on what's going on in my jaw, what does it feel like? Can I progressively relax that? I don't even have to really deal with the stress because I can start to deal with the, the emotion underneath it. And oftentimes, it's not nearly as, as bad as I think it is when I'm sitting awake at 3 a.m. stressing about giving a presentation, as an example. Um, so let's get into conflict. Here's our definition of conflict. Note this word perception shows up, that the root does of this per perceive, which is from the root perception. We perceive something to be incompatible. We perceive opposing viewpoints. At this point, we this should, is it real? Is it really a conflict? Um, I don't know about you, but I can remember times I've been in disagreements and realized, wow, we actually had a lot more in common in terms of what we were thinking than we thought we did when the whole thing started. Um, and we can stop and think, what am I feeling? And that's always a great thing to do before we respond. What am I feeling? Um, I had a student last semester that uh, who uh, couldn't stop talking. If it was a classroom discussion, he would dominate. And as soon as classroom discussion was over, he start talking to his neighbor. And so I ended up moving him to somewhere else in the class. What was I feeling? I, I, honestly, what I was feeling was like, what am I, a high school teacher? I need a seating chart. And I realized my pride was being sort of impacted by my, my ego, was being impacted by this need to a, address the situation. So I definitely had a forced move situation. I couldn't go through the whole semester with this student talking nonstop. He's a good student, a good kid, um, just couldn't stop talking. 
So I really had to think about what I was feeling before I let words come out of my mouth. Because if I hadn't, I would have responded with something that sounded maybe angry, probably a little sarcastic. I, I tend to go there and it wouldn't have been productive. So it was a moment where I had to separate what am I observing? How am I evaluating it? What am I feeling? What's my perception? Well, my perception in this situation is this kid's a college student. He should know better, blah, 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 blah. I'm kind of going to this default setting of thinking that all students are me. They're not. Um, and I was far from a perfect student, so far be it from me to judge. Okay. What emotions? Anger. I was feeling some anger there. Was my perception accurate? So my perception of the situation was accurate. That was reality. But my perception of what it meant was inaccurate. Nothing this student was doing was directed at me personally. It wasn't even this. The student was just, just had a lot of energy, a lot to say, probably some nervousness. So by breaking that down, I was able to separate out some elements to it and respond to it in a very measured way about the part that actually was an incompatibility of goals. Go back to this, remember. I have a goal of teaching the students. By breaking it down, I could focus on that part that was being affected, which was the classroom and the other students' ability to learn. And for that matter, that student's ability to learn. And none of the stuff that had to do with me personally and my ego. Um, so here's our definition again. I guess I could have gone this way. If we break it down some more, we want to think about this. What does the student want? What does that student who can't stop talking want? Um, do they need attention? Uh, do they need some sort of validation? Are we really in opposition? Is this how they learn? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. But I want to stop and think about that. And this is where I've worked with the students, thinking, what's what do we have in common? Well, we both are need to be here for 42 hours. I want you to pass. You want to pass. What can we do together to make this situation work? What options do we have? And it was just as simple as moving the student up front and he could get more eye contact and attention from me without necessarily talking more. And I gave him opportunities to talk when we had discussions and it just kind of ended up more or less, everybody was happy without it turning into something ugly. Um, was it a forced move? And this is a question we wanna ask ourselves. Do we need to deal with this situation? Um, or is this just our feelings telling us we need to somehow defend ourselves or respond? I had another situation. I had a student come into class um, reeking of marijuana. And that was a, like, I got to deal with it. Um, if it, it made me sick to my stomach. The smell was so strong. And I had to deal with it. And again, I had this sort of really feelings driven response to that of it being disrespectful and what are you thinking and why da, 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 da. and I just had to kind of center myself and think mindfully and what I decided to do was I said you know someone has clearly been using recreational drugs and uh, I'd like that person to leave and if that person doesn't want to leave you know I will have to call the police officer in to deal with this situation but I managed to deliver it in a way that wasn't emotional and the person left and apologized. And it, it, it wasn't cool, but I had to do something. There was no way we could sit there for an hour and 25 minutes with that stink, um, as, especially that smell. So we get in these situations, we get in them with our colleagues, we get in them with students, we get in them with ourselves, but that's another whole conversation, our interpersonal communication. But these are some basic questions we can ask ourselves when we get into this. First, is it real or is this just a perceived thing? Did this really happen or am I just, what am I feeling? How's this influencing my perception? What emotions are here? Are these accurate? 
And then we can ask ourselves, are these things really incompatible? Or do we want the same thing, but maybe we're feeling different things and the feeling is the conflict. And those of you in long-term relationships can probably relate to that idea because if you probably want the same things, which is why you're together. So what's really happening there? And not to say that there aren't opposing viewpoints about what to do with things like raising children and money and so forth. Those things are big deals. But oftentimes when it comes down to what should we get for dinner, it's not really about an incompatible goal or an opposing viewpoint as much as it is different feelings. Um, and obviously we're look, there's more to it than that because there's a history there. There's that nudging of tilt that happens because over time, choosing what to eat for dinner can uh, sort of be emblematic of other things, but we're, we're off topic. Um, so the last thing I want to say to you, and this really has to do with, if you decide to go down this road, I want to, uh, uh, I've been watching a lot of British TV, so I just said route instead of root. Um, but uh, I just want to remind you of the stages of competence, because this idea of trying to become mindful is one of the most painful things I've ever done. Um, and, uh, you know, it started with, I was did some research into CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and then ACT, which is action commitment therapy. And it led me to mindfulness. And then I started trying to practice meditation and be more mindful. And it sucks. Meditation sucks. Being mindful sucks. It sucks. It sucks. It sucks. <laughs> so let's look at that really briefly before I send you on your way. Not that I think I've changed your life, but I think this if it get, the seed gets planted. It's important to remember we go through unconscious incompetence, which is how I've lived most of my life in terms of my feelings and emotions and the way they influenced my actions. Um, I've always been quick to respond emotionally. I uh, have with my feelings and had a temper when I was a child and all kinds. Uh, I, my animation went wrong. So we start with unconscious incompetence, whatever we're doing, not just our feelings, but, and then we go into a, we become aware that we're incompetent, conscious, conscious incompetence. And this is the painful part because you're aware of it, but you still suck at it. And then hopefully you develop conscious competence where you can actually practice in a competent way. And then you go into hopefully unconscious competence where you can do something. So learning a musical instrument, I still face challenges as a guitarist and I become aware that something I've been doing is not really working. I become conscious of it. I go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. And then I practice and then eventually it becomes I don't, I don't have to think about it. So I want to share this um, thought with you. So meditation, mindfulness, meditation, any of that is not a, it's, it's not a cure-all. Um, but we have the option of this discomfort of becoming aware of what's going on in our head versus the discomfort of being ruled by them. And as I said before, you get stuck in a stage of being aware of what's going on and still being controlled by it. And it, it does suck. Um, I, in the past week, I can think of one time for sure when I responded in a way which I I, I so wish I had to do over, but I don't, and and I can only try to fix it retroactively. But um, trying to be aware of it is, is is just sort of the first step. But it it does work. Um, I certainly uh, do better in class with my students for sure. Um, and it just taking that moment to pause, separate myself from it, think about what I'm feeling, ask myself these questions, breathe a little bit, and I can deal with these these things in a, in a much better way. Uh, and that's really all I have for you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'd love to hear from any of you, thoughts you have, 
uh, any questions. Um, Harlan uh, Faye just dropped in chat. I tell myself all the time, just because you're having a feeling doesn't mean you have to act on it. Exactly. And it, and it is that simple. Um, it, 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 it doesn't make it the feeling go away, though, does it, Faye? It does not. <laughs> <laughs> that part sucks. But uh... <laughs> um, I will say I appreciate you making that distinction that I I used to know, but I had kind of forgotten, right? The emotion and the feeling. Um, we use those two words interchangeably, but they are not synonymous. And so like you summarizing what you did today, just really like pulled in information that's been floating around up here from different sources. And you just did it for me. You did a brilliant job of summarizing it and reminding me the crucial like thing here is the difference between emotion and feeling and then what we do about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad that was, a, I'm glad it was effective. I will draw your attention to the chat. There is a link to the feedback survey. If you would please complete that. We greatly appreciate your feedback on each session that the Teaching Center leads. I also want to invite you to join us for the next session at 10 a.m., which is instructor training on Respondus Monitor and Lockdown Browser. Thank you, Harlan, for your presentation today. Thank you for your leadership. And I'm going to stop the recording.